بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره uh, first, I should apologize for my delay. And then I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and guidance for, inshallah, addressing this important issue. Uh, our topic is seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why and how, and then, inshallah, we talk about istikhara. For sure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides everyone with guidance, whether they want it or not, whether they appreciate or not, whether they understand or not. Allah's guidance is offered to everyone. This is inclusive guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to Quran, this even is extended to non-human beings. So not only every human being is given guidance, but everything created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given guidance. As we say in Surah A'la, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَحَدَى Allah is the one who created and then he made everything in a very balanced measure and he is the one who has guided when Pharaoh asked Prophet Musa and Harun Allah Nabiina wa Ali wa alayhim as salam wa man rabbukuma ya Musa who is your Lord Prophet Musa said rabbuna alladhi a'ta kulla shay'in khalqahu thumma hada our Lord is the one who has given everything its due creation and then guided. So we have this principle of uh, general guidance or al hidayatul amma, which is extended to everything created by Allah. And for sure, it's very much uh, available for every rational being, every human being or jinn who need guidance for finding their path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ أَمْشَاجٍ نَبْتَلِي فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا بَسِيرًا إِنَّا هَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلِ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا So this is one level of guidance which is given to everything and in the first place human beings. I don't want to talk about the methods or the ways that Allah provides this guidance whether it is through instincts or for example through reason or whatever or conscience. But we know that there is general guidance. Then we have extra guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who appreciate the initial offer of guidance. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us something through our reason or through our conscience or through revelation, if we appreciate and follow it and act upon it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would show us more what we need to do, would guide us more about what we are supposed to do. So this is extra guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, for example, says about Ashabul Kahf, Innahum fityatun amanu barabbihim wa zidnahum hudan. They were believers in the Lord, and we increased their guidance. We gave them more. So here we have a role to play. The first was an offer which was free. You don't need to do anything. Allah gives you without expecting anything. But the second is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give to the people who have benefited from the first type of guidance. But the second type of guidance 
has many different types. This a specific or a special or extra or additional guidance has many different types. Sometimes it is general. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us when we use our reason towards the Quran, towards the Prophet, towards Ahlul Bayt And then we would have access to a rich source of guidance. But that would be for me and you the same. Everyone can have this access to this common source. But there is another type of a specific guidance or a special or additional guidance that people can receive in a very personal way. Personal guidance can come to you. You are maybe stuck in a situation in which you don't know what to do about your family life, about your study, about your business, about community affairs. So it's not just enough to be given general guidelines. You need something about this particular time and this particular context. What am I supposed to do in this very specific situation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us also this type of solution. You know, in the Quran, maybe these two verses refer to these two types. We have Sirat, as you know, and we have Subul. Sirat is only one. We have Sirat al-Mustaqim. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqim. We have only one right path. In the Quran, Sirat is never used in plural form. We have only one path, and that is the path of serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worshipping Allah, obeying the Prophet. Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam, Allah ta'abudu shaytan, innahu lakum adubun mubin, wa ane abuduni hadha siratum mustaqim. So we have only one path, right and a straight path. But then in the Quran, Allah talks about subul. And subul can be for even guidance, not for misguidance. For example, when Allah talks about the Quran, He says, Yahdi bihillahu man ittaba'a ridwanahu subul as salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the Quran, guides those who seek His pleasure to the ways of peace. Yahdi bihillahu man ittaba'a ridwanahu subul as salam. So we have one Sirat, but we have also many different ways under one Sirat. My understanding is this. You know that you have to serve God. You know that you have to obey the Prophet. You don't, you, you don't want to follow Shaitan. Okay. But this has to be broken down into many different areas of life. How can I serve God with respect to my family situation? What does that require from me as a father or as a husband or as a son or as a brother? These are not sarat, these are sobol, these are the ways which are under that one general uh, path. Or for example, what should I do as a, for example, a student, what should I do as an employee or as an employer? What should I do as a, uh, I don't know, for example, a Muslim living in a non-Muslim society? So there are many, many things in our life that would require a certain type of behavior and response all must be under the umbrella of But how to serve God in these different contexts, this needs a specific guidelines, and that is Sobul. And interestingly, according to the Quran itself, if we manage to follow that general path by implementing these 
instructions of the Quran, we would achieve salam. We would achieve peace. Yahdi bihillahu man ittaba'a ridwanahu subul as salam. We would have peace in family. We would have peace in society. We would have peace in workplace. We would have peace in our mosque. We would have also peace in our heart. So if we follow shaitan, we would never have peace internally and externally. If we follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know how to follow him, know how to act proportionate to his expectations, then we would achieve peace internally and externally. So this type of guidance is much more than just getting general instructions. This is to be very applicable, uh, very much applicable to the varying situations. Again here, sometimes we may face a situation that we cannot make decision because although we have enough knowledge about Islamic teachings, for example, we know fiqhi aspect of it, we know moral aspect of it, but still we cannot make decision. Why? Because we don't have certain data. For example, maybe I have some money, I want to use it for charity. So I have no doubt that in Islam charity is very important. But whether I should spend it here or not. Someone says, you know, we want to make a mosque. Someone says, I want to make a school. Someone says, you know, I have no money to, for example, eat. Different suggestions may come. Sometimes you can understand based on the Islamic teachings what is the priority. But sometimes you cannot understand what is the priority because of the specific situation that you are in. So what should you do now? Or for example, you want to um, start a business. You don't know whether this would be successful or not. Islamically, it is okay. From fiqhi point of view, from moral point of view, there is no problem, but you don't know what to do. Or you want to marry. You know that this person is a good person and all the initial checkings give you green light, but still you are not sure. So here we need, again, a very, very specific guidance. It's not just the guidance which is given to every human being. It's not the guidance which is given through the Quran. It's not even the guidance in the form of Subul as salam It's very, very specific. Sometimes maybe when we look at both sides, we find both are morally the same. Both are perhaps pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our understanding. So here we need to seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very special way. We need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance for this particular case. It's not just enough to say, ehdena sarat al-mustaqim. We have to ask Allah for guidance in this particular case. This is what we have in our hadith. And in our hadith, we have this recommendation that if you are faced with such a situation in which you don't know what to do, not because you don't know Islamic teachings, not because you don't know fiqh or akhlaq. No, you know all these things, but the particularities of the case make you unable to decide, then you have to do istikhara. You have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for good, for goodness. Then under this, we have different things. One of them is what we call normally istikhara. Otherwise, there are many other things. So I would like to mention some levels of this istikhara, which is in the literal sense, seeking goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is just to be in the state of calling upon Allah for good. You ask Allah that what is good would be given to you. For example, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in a hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a hadith Qudsi, said, من شقاء عبدي 
ان يعمل الاعمال ولا يستخيرني one of the aspects of being uh, not fortunate being not you know in a good condition for my servant is he does his things without asking me for goodness so without istikhara means without asking seeking help from me or asking me to bring something which is good for him he does his things so istikhara here means to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for good we have another hadith from imam baqir alayhi salam imam baqir alayhi salam says that my father uh, whenever he wanted to do something of course it means something important something that imam wanted to make sure that he is making proper decision not you know for example drinking water or you know uh, going to the mosque whenever he wanted to do something he used to make wuzu say two rak a prayer and after prayer 200 times he used to ask allah for good istikhara 200 times what does it mean it means he was praying insisting on allah to give him good and then after that after praying after wuzu after salat all these things then my father was doing what he wanted to do for example if he wanted to i don't know buy a house or if he wanted to go for a trip that he was not sure this was what he used to do there is a hadith from amirul mu'minin alayhi salam that if you want to do something and you want guidance from allah say do to a prayer and hundred times say astakhirullah i ask goodness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then pray and then do what you want to do so you see here asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and for goodness doesn't involve opening the quran or using tasbih it's more a matter of dua a matter of calling upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help another thing that we have in our hadith which is by itself very important and is a quranic principle is mashwara or mashura in arabic both can be used consultation it is so important that even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet that you should consult people. Washawirhum fil amr. Although they were not equal to the Prophet, let alone to be better than the Prophet, but still the Prophet had to consult them. Why? Because sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us through the words of other people. So consultation is a very important process of asking Allah for goodness. For example, there is a hadith from Imam Sadiq salam. It's very beautiful. Imam Sadiq salam says, whenever you want to do something, before making consultation, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Ask Allah for advice. Ask Allah's opinion. The person says, what do you mean? Imam says, it means that first you pray that Allah guides you. Then you go to your believer brother or sister and consult him. So in this way, Allah is putting what he wants to tell you in the word of your brother or sister. So there are several hadiths like this, that before you go for consultation, ask Allah to help you by putting the truth in the mind and word of that person. There is another hadith that Sayyid ibn Tawus narrates from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam said, whenever one of you Shia want to buy or sell something or do something, first ask Allah for goodness and then ask the opinion of 10 mu'min if it is something very important, 10 mu'min, 
If you don't have 10 mu'min and you have five mu'min, consult them twice. So five in two would be 10. If you don't have five, you have two. So consult each five times. If there is only one, consult him 10 times. I think in my understanding, this is emphasis that you should be ready to consult people not once many times it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to definitely 10 times you know it means that it's so important that even if there is only one person you go several times it means that you should have no hesitation and no arrogance because sometimes you know there is arrogance also why i should ask people for help if I ask them for help, if I ask them for opinion, they may think that I am not able to decide. But this is a matter of also humbleness, that you are ready to take advice from anyone. There is a hadith that uh, Imam uh, Reza alayhi salam says, my, my father's intellect was of course better than anyone else. But he had a servant, he had a slave, and he used to consult him. Imam used to consult this person. Some people used to tell Imam, why do you consult your servant? Imam salam said, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing to his mind what is good for me. So many times Imam was consulting this person about farming, you know, and the garden that Imam had, you know, what is your idea, what is your opinion? So when Imam is doing this, it means that we should have no hesitation to ask people for their opinion. Even it might be my student, maybe my child. We shouldn't go, oh, no, I only ask, you know, opinion of a very, very great person. No, it's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is putting in the mind or word of this person what you need. So you ask Allah for help, then you go and consult people. Another thing that we have in our hadith is, inshallah, if I have time, I will ask, how much time, or I have already finished? <laughs> Another five minutes. Okay. Another thing that we have, you know, if I, shall I get time or you ask me, then I will uh, give you this in a kind of order. But at the moment, uh, there is order, but I can explain the order later. Uh, another thing is that when we want to do something and we are not sure, sometimes in our hadith says that you do some special a'mal or dua, as I will read, inshallah, and then Whatever comes to your heart, you do it. This is also another thing that we have. And these are all to be put together. Inshallah, I will explain. For example, there is a hadith that we have in the books by Sheikh Kulaini, Sheikh Tusi, Sayyid Ibn Tabus, the late Tabarsi. They say that Ibn Asbat wanted to go to Egypt and he was not sure whether he should go by land you know take a for example I don't know camel or whatever or should you know take the uh, sea and Imam alayhi salam told him say to rak a prayer go to sajda ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hundred times for goodness and then whatever occurs to you, whatever comes to your heart, do it. We have also something similar. For example, another person asked Imam alayhi salam, I have a, an asset, a property I want to sell. What should I do? I am not sure. Imam alayhi salam said, say two rak as salat, then hundred times ask goodness from Allah, don't talk to anyone when you are doing this, and then whatever comes to your heart, you do it. And we have things like this. Another thing that we have in our hadith, and more, in, perhaps more than also hadith, 
in the practice of ulama is to do istikhara with the Quran or tasbih. We have something uh, in, the Quran, in the hadith, inshallah, I can mention later during question and answer. But more important is also in the practice. People have seen it's working. That when you are not sure about something, then you can open the Quran. If, inshallah, there is time or you ask, I can say some of the methods which are mentioned in hadith and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Or you use tasbih and ask for guidance. This is another method which is now very common. So whenever we say istikhara, this comes to our mind. If I want to put all these in a system or as an order, so I think this very much depends on the case and the amount of uncertainty that you have. Sometimes I know that something is good, but I am worried that maybe I am losing something which is better. So I am not very much concerned about good and bad. Here, when it's a matter of being good or being better or better, and for example, I don't know, best, here the amount of care and the amount of, you know, I don't know, uh, a struggle is less than those cases in which you are worried. Maybe I, if I do this, I will suffer a lot. Sometimes, you know, there is something that it can be irreversible. If I do this, maybe I can never, you know, change the situation into previous condition. So, depending on seriousness of issue, Depending on how much you are uncertain, depending on the urgency of the issue. Sometimes I have to make a quick decision and there is not that many people around. If I want to delay, the whole thing is finished. So you, the seriousness of the issue, your le amount of uncertainty, urgency, how many people are around that can give you good advice, so these will create different scenarios. And this is why in our hadith we have different suggestions. But if it is you and you have plenty of time and the situation is very serious, so I think the wise thing would be this. That first of all, you make sure that you know all the general guidelines about this case. You know the fiqhi rules, you know moral issues about this. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for goodness and you do it after salat, you do it with the pure intention because I think many times our problem is caused by our attachment to one side. Many times, you know, even I myself can know the answer, and if someone else asks me, I can give him you know, quickly the answer. But because my emotions are very much connected here, I am blinded. I cannot you know, see the proper thing. So when you can make sure that by repeating this astakhirullah, by doing salah, doing wuzu, you can remove these things, then you don't need to ask other people for opinion. Sometimes, you know, when you are in a very uh, good situation, very, you know, you have very holy feeling, many things become clear for you. As soon as you go back to the normal life, then still uh, you have question. So many times we are suffering from uncertainty because we have attachment to one side or maybe both sides so this is one scenario but sometimes no even if i really struggle to purify my intention and clarify my mind from anything selfish still i may not know what should i do 
or maybe I'm not sure whether I have been able to clarify the, my mind from anything which is darkening my mind. So here you have to definitely go and ask people's opinion. It means that here you need someone who can look at this case from outside and someone who may bring a wisdom here. So here you have to do consultation. If with consultation you are clear, Alhamdulillah. If you are not clear, then that is the time that you open Tasbih, uh, Quran or you use Tasbih. So not as a, the first choice. So you have to make sure you have proper understanding of general guidelines first. You have to make sure that your intention, your thought are not darkened by your lower desires. Third, you have consulted people. If still you are stuck and you don't know, then here you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for very, very specific guidance. And that is, oh Allah, I have done my best. I've gone through all these things, but still I don't know what to do. So now I open the Quran. Please you tell me what to do with respect to this case or I use tasbih. Inshallah, I will talk about the methods if you have questions. So I hope with this very quick and brief uh, description of the issue of guidance and how to get guidance you know, specifically, at least I have clarified a little bit this issue. Uh, Sheikh, uh, just a question. Um, if you do um, sort of consult and then um, do the, the salat, do rakat, and um, astaghfirullah, and then if you get a feeling that you should do um, either A or B, if there are two options, um, and suppose it came to your heart that you do A, yeah. are you then bound to do A? Um, or can you then sort of change your mind? or? Is this sort of then does does it then become compulsory on you to to take that option? No, it's not becoming compulsory, but it would be r very rational to do it because you know if you have done all these things and uh, why you then you should go for the one which is less probable to be the best, yeah. So rationally, you should do it. But if you don't do it and go to the other option, it's not haram, it's not a uh, you know, violation of any rules of fiqh or sharia. Even if you do tasbih with Quran or, uh, sorry, istikhar with tasbih or Quran, our ulama say it's not haram to disregard it. But it's not good because you have done all you know, stages and you have asked Allah for guidance. So you should not. Uh, disregard this but if you for any reason want to do the opposite side it's not a problem you pay sadaqa uh, and you can do it so it's not wajib to follow this but it would be very uh, rational to do it mostly your rational sense in in ordinary things you would or even in complex things I, i've always believed that you can use your reason powers of reason to come to a decision uh, is there a danger that you sometimes become too dependent on this approach where for even yeah. you know minor things you start then doing istikharas and so on? I know yes. of some cases where this happens, so I just yes. wanted your comments on that. Yes, yes, there is a, this risk that you may become too much dependent on istikhara. Especially if you see istikhara is all the time working, you know? So you become dependent. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also worrying if you are too much independent. <laughs> because then you think that I can understand everything by myself. Yeah? So it's a matter of you know, really honestly, humbly assessing your situation. If you, with the help of other people, with using you know uh, conventional methods, you can make decision. Okay, you make decision, but you ask Allah for help before making decision. But if you think that you cannot make decision, there are things that you are not sure. There are things that, for example, are not predictable. Then you do astakhara. But we have to be careful not to overdo it. I wanted to say first that personally, I don't particularly rely on 
let's say the last two forms of istikara that you said with the tasbih and the Quran because it's like what the brother asked if you are now compelled to do what you what Allah has guided you towards because if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance then why turn the other direction if he sent you for example the prophet saying something would you turn the other direction if that's the form of guidance that he sent to you so to me I think that form of istikara for my personal practice is a last resort and the other thing that I want to say which is more of a question in terms of the istikara with the Quran I know that people consult um, others to do it for them for example sheikhs and ulama to do it on their behalf um, is there a risk of personal biases being involved in that in terms of the other person's interpretation of the Quran um, granted that they are not masum mm -hmm. and their interpretation of the Quran is not flawless um, should that for example be something that you personally do for yourself uh, with respect to the first point uh, of course if Rasulullah says something we don't do uh, but as I said this is where the teachings of Islam in the form of Quran or Sunnah would be still leaving the situation undecided okay so it this is very otherwise if there is a clear teaching of Islam you know in the form of hadith or Quran we don't need to do istikhara. Uh, the about doing istikhara for yourself or letting another person indeed here uh, we have uh, no fixed guideline some great ulama who used to do istikhara and people you know very much relied on their istikhara they used not to do istikhara for themselves. They used to ask other people to do istikhara for them. And I think this is very much the case with respect to Quran. Because with respect to tasbih, your attachment to the case doesn't that much, you know, affect. Because, for example, either at the end there are two seats or one seat. But your understanding of the verse can sometimes be shadowed by what? By your emotions. So here I think it would be good if you ask someone else, if you want to do with Quran, to ask someone else to do this. Uh, another thing is also important that we have some people that Allah has given them some gift. They have the ability to tell you when you ask you know istikhara about your case even i know someone that sometimes he tells you the answer before opening the quran it comes to his heart or for example there is an alim that he opens the quran but even before you have any chance of thinking that he can read he gives you the answer because these people have some gift that the answer comes to their heart and one of these ulama was asked by a center in Qom who does you know computing you know Islamic science, uh, sciences that could you please tell us which ayah is good which ayah is bad which ayah is middle that we put it in a suffer and he said no because sometimes for the same ayah I get the impression that this person should do it and for another person I get the impression that he shouldn't do it so uh, this is a special type of gift that some people have and because of this also some people become very interested in istikhara because they see these people you know say about their you know particular case so you don't say anything but he says that you want to buy this house and this house has this problem for example so uh, coming back to your question I think if you want to do istikhara with the Quran it's better not to do it for yourself or someone that you know what is his case because you can be affected by your personal attachment
Um, I, I just would like to just add about uh, the question of um, ob obsessive compulsive behavior with respect to Sahara, um, in the sense that, um, as somebody was mentioning, um, what if you do the Sahara and uh, you know you might still have a preference for one thing or the other, and so forth. Um, you know, a apart from these cases where you have uh, some shiuch. Uh, or holy people who could give you a very, very clear idea and convince <coughs> you um, about the decisions that you have made. Uh, I think part of decisiveness is the ability to act in the face of the unknown, okay? Um, that, and that uh, what Istikhara does, it helps to clarify that, <coughs> you know, but there is still a certain unknown aspect to it that um, you know you are required to uh, be energized into taking that decisive step. And this is why the, the istikhara continues that while one is, 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 is doing the action, because one is always calling upon Allah who can change all things to uh, make that particular action good. So I think one very important thing is, is that we should be careful about our attachment to uh, istikhara, especially the last two forms of istikhara. Can you please tell us how to do istikhara with Quran? Yeah. There are different methods. One method, you know, I have here from Sayyid ibn Tawus. Sayyid ibn Tawus, rahmatullah, you know, he was a great scholar. And at the same time, he was very uh, familiar with du'as and rituals. So the, the way he suggests is this. He says, you take Quran and recite this du'a. Allahumma in kana fi qada'ika wa qadarika an tamunna ala ummat nabiyyika bi zuhur waliyyika wa abn bint nabiyyik fa'ajjil dhalik wa sahilhu wa yassirhu wa kammilhu وأخرج لي آية أستدل بها على أمر فأتمر أو نهي فأنتهي في عافية. He says, Oh Allah, if in your decree, قضاء قدر, is to oblige the ummah, the nation of the Prophet, by bringing Imam Zaman, who is the your wali and the son of the daughter of your prophet. So please make it easy, make it faster, and bring for me a verse of the Quran that from that I can understand that you want me to do it, so I do it, or you want me not to do it, so I don't do it. So in a case, he is praying for the faraj of Imam Zaman, and he says, if this is your decision, and we know it's his decision, so please also do this. Then you have your intention in your mind, you open the Quran. Then you turn seven pages. And then you go to the page on the left side and read the seventh line. Then that is giving you answer. This is what Ayatollah Lankarudi Rahmatullah used to do, you know, uh, whenever we went to him for istikhara. So you turn seven pages, and then you go to the left side. So for example, if this is the Quran, so it's Surah Ham. Seven pages, then here in the middle, seventh line. That is the answer. But there is also another method, and that is you pray, you ask for guidance. For example, this is one dua. Allahumma inni tafa'altu bi kitabika wa tabakkaltu alayk fa'arni min kitabika ma huwa maktumun min sirrika al-maknun fi ghaybik. Oh Allah, I ask guidance through your book. I trust you. Please show me from your book what is hidden. Then you open the Quran and you read the first line of the right side. And then based on that, you understand what to do. Of course, it is said that it should be complete Quran, not a Quran which has only few pages. It should be complete Quran, 
with uh, normal way of writing, not that the Quran that they produce that all the verse is good in, in the beginning of the <laughs> right page. You know, you cannot manipulate this. So it should be very normal and very random. Even some uh, people try not to use those Qurans that every page starts necessarily with a new verse because they say this is again not random. You know, they have done in the way that uh, every verse finishes in the previous page. Some people don't use this. But I personally uh, think doing istikhara with Quran for those who are not a scholars, maybe it's difficult. It's problematic because you may not be able to understand. Ayatollah Marashi Najafi mentions a story about someone meeting Imam Zaman and a similar istikhara with tasbih is there. So you uh, say three times, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. According to the one that Ayatollah Marashi says, Astakhirullah bi rahmatihi khiyaratan fi afiyah. Astakhirullah bi rahmatihi khiyaratan fi afiyah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy something good but also with afia, means not without too much difficulties and troubles. Goodness and afia together. Three times. So three times, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Three times, astakhirullah bi rahmatihi khiyaratan fi afia. And then you take one handhold of seeds. Okay? So, for example, After making niya, so you take from one side, okay? So you take like this. You know, you you put your hand in one side, okay? Take normal tasbih, complete tasbih, and then make niya after saying this, and then take one handhold. Okay, then start counting. Take two by two. At the end, either two remains or one. Okay? If two remains, it's bad. If one remains, it's good. But according to the method that I do, this doesn't mean it's necessarily good. If two remains bad, then I do for the opposite side. I repeat it. If the opposite side is bad, so this is good. If opposite side is also good, it means it's middle. What if you made somebody go against the istikhara? No problem. Uh, it's not good to go against the istikhara, but it's not a problem. You can pay sadaqah and go against it. Okay. Also, about repeating istikhara, some people ask, you know, is it good to repeat istikhara? Again, the answer is, it's not haram to, do, to repeat, but it doesn't make sense to repeat istikhara unless the situation has changed. If you think that a new factor has come up that might have changed the situation, then you repeat. Otherwise, if they say it's the same thing, no. Uh, Sheikh, now just regarding the techniques of istikhara, yeah. and your, in your, uh, with your uh, um, experience from the sources of uh, the hadith, what is the eldest st uh, style or technique that goes back to any of the Imams like Imam Ali or Imam Hussein or even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because there are multiple methods uh, so w I'm just trying to see wh whether there is any technique was used by, by any of the <coughs> Imams uh, previously. You know, uh, the way I said, you know, with the Quran, this is quoted from the Prophet that you use Quran, you say three times قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ three times salawat and then you say Allahumma tafa'altu bi kitabika wa tawakkaltu alayk fa'arni min kitabika ma huwa maktumun min sirrik al maknuna fi ghaybik so this is from the Prophet whether all ulama accept the authenticity of this hadith this is a, you know, a scholarly issue and some people may not accept but it is quoted from the Prophet but Sayyid ibn Tabus in addition to that method that I said that, you know, seven pages of Quran you turn, 
He says that the best way is istikhara with papers. Istikhara with papers. They call it zatur raqa. You like, you know, drawing lots. Zatur raqa. We have this in the Quran also about Prophet uh, Zakaria, you know, when he wanted to be guardian of Lady Maryam, you know, they had dispute. Allah said, Ma kunta ladayhim az yulguna aglam hum ayyuhum yakfulu Maryam. So they say that Sayyid Haymari asked Imam Zaman alayhi salam about what to do, and Imam alayhi salam said that uh, you take, you know, six, you know, pieces of paper, and then he gives the instruction how to do it, you know, uh, three of them, you know, for example, you write something which shows you should do, three of them that you shouldn't do, and then you put it and pray and bring it out. It's in also Mafati, you can see it in Mafati, Zatur Raqqa. Okay. I personally think that uh, Estakhara is not something that you must believe in it, you know, if you are a Shia, this is a, one of our principles or, you know, one of our doctrines that you have to believe. But this is something that has some basis. We have hadith about it. Maybe those hadith are not necessarily all very strong that a faqih can issue fatwa on them. But for this type of thing, you don't need that strength. And also we have uh, practice of ulama. So you can say it's reliable, but at the same time, it's not something that religiously you must believe in that. Otherwise, you, there is a weakness in your iman. No, if you don't believe, it's okay. You can, you know, there is no sign of weakness of iman. But if you want to uh, do something when you are a stock, it, it seems that it has enough of evidence as backup so that you can say that, you know, I have done my best and inshallah, Allah would be pleased with the decision that I make. Uh, I just want to thank you and again apologize for uh, starting late. Uh, I hope that inshallah what I said was uh, uh, useful. If it was not useful, you know, please uh, forgive. Maybe the time was too short and I had to rush. Uh, what is important and what's the underlying principle is that we always need Allah's guidance. We always have to pray to Allah to guide us. We always should be ready for asking opinion of other mu'mineen. These are very important. And then, of course, at the end, if you are not sure, then you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you through either Quran or Tasbih or papers. But the main thing is that as a mu'min, we should be all the time clear that the only way of understanding and guidance for us is connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah leaves us even for a moment to ourselves, we can make very funny mistakes. You can be a very wise person, a very experienced person, but if Allah leaves you to yourself, you make such a mistake that everyone would laugh at you. So we should never you know, rely on my history, or no, my experience, my credentials. We should only rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I hope inshallah Allah guides us as individuals and inshallah guide our community inshallah towards the best. Thank you very much. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alam.